you there. Hey. Good morning. How are you today? I hope you're having a great day so far. My name is Amanda Kuluba, and today is Thursday, which means it's time for Art That Makes You Smarter. If you're new here, welcome. Hello to you. I'm Amanda, and on Thursdays, I sit down, and I get ready, and I have a little artsy-fartsy talk about a work of art that's been on my mind. So if you're a teacher who uses art in your instruction or you're an art educator or you're just an art lover, this is the place for you. And I strongly suggest you hit that subscribe button, that cute little red subscribe button down there because I'm here for you every Thursday. So let's get started. This week, I wanna talk about Mary Cassatt. Now, as I'm uh, talking to you, I'm gonna put on my makeup. So getting ready, um, this is my concealer. Mary Cassatt was born on May 22nd, 1844, and she was an American artist. She was born in what is what would now be known as Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, but when she was born, it was a se its own separate place. Um, now she was she was born into privilege, y'all. She like her family was like a banking family, and her brother went on to be like the president of a railroad, so she was quite privileged. And because of that, she was well educated, even though not all women were very well educated back then. So she was well educated and she was well traveled because her family believed that part of a good education was travel. Here's something her dad was actually a land speculator and a stock broker. So those are big, fancy, rich people words. And her mother came from her own banking family. So lots of privilege for Mary. Um, but she went to college to, she wanted to study art. Her family did not want her to, um, but she did it anyway. And she went to college in Pennsylvania to study art. But she, she said they might as well not be teaching anything here because she was a girl female and they didn't let the female students use live models they just kind of it was just kind of like a oh isn't that cute she wants to study art kind of thing so mary was like well i'm not learning anything so i'm about to go travel so she went on ahead and went to france because you know that's where um, at the time a lot of artists were living and working in france um it's very very pale she, but i can fix it um you would think she would have like an easy time because she's just made of money um, and her parents were just made of money and they were but her dad said basically said if you're going to do this you're going to have to fund it so you're going to have to work and you're going to have to use what you make from your art to fund your art so he didn't buy her supplies he didn't like purchase a gallery exhibition for her she had to do it all which um i'd be like excuse me daddy i think you need to buy me some paint like that's the least you can do. You can't just buy me a little bit of paint, a few brushes, some paper maybe. Um, but her dad, it was probably a good thing for her because it made her a stronger woman. I'm sure it made her a stronger woman. And she, you know, the whole starving artist, when you're hungry, you work hard kind of thing. So um, she, I think he did her a favor in the long run. So while she was in, oh, there's, I hate it when hair gets in my face. While she was in, France. She had a studio that was like a five minute walk away from where Edgar Degas had a studio. So they became friends. He would, he made a habit of popping by and he would, you know, give her some feedback on what she was doing, which I'm sure she loved. Um, came over to mansplain about her artwork. But he also helped her get models, which, I, you know, based on what I read about her not being able to get models them not using models for the female artist in college, the college she went to, I imagine it could have been hard to acquire her own models for her work. So having Degas go out and help her get those was probably really beneficial. And it, you know, nothing that I saw hinted about them having any kind of romantic relationship. I did see that as they got older, their friendship became much more of a commercial one and less of just an organic like um, neighborly kind of relationship, but they did spend a lot of time together. They would even go to like museums together and look at artwork. Um, oh my goodness. Big shock. Shocker. Shocker. I need a messy mat for my makeup. Mary is living in France, living in Paris, and she, she still continues to travel her whole life. 
um, her the last trip that I read about was uh, she went to Egypt and when she came back she was just tired and she's like I just I'm tired I, I've done all I can do um, but she was really popular because of these uh, mother and child works uh, if you have ever heard of Mary Cassatt you have probably seen one of her mother and child and it's uh, interesting to me as a mother uh, I guess and as a daughter too but Mary didn't have any children so of course she was someone's daughter. She had a mother and I believe they were close, but she didn't have her own children. So the thing about her work that really, really, really sticks in my head is you have this woman who's painting things about being, about womanhood and motherhood combined, um, who has not experienced motherhood. Now, could she have had a longing for motherhood? I don't know. I didn't see anything to indicate that, but I don't know. Uh, so that's irrelevant to what I'm about to say. But she definitely was able to capture like parts of the experience of being a woman that happen whether you're a mother or not through her portraits of mothers and their children. So there's one where she's giving the child a bath. And if you look, you think, Oh, there's okay so there's several of her works where she's given the children a bath but she looks almost like she's teaching the child how to bathe and it, it makes it makes you think about hey you know like mothers teach their children things so what is this what is this um knowledge that's passed down from mother to child and so she's kind of addressing that experience of being a woman whether or not you have children, even though she's, because whether or not you have children, you are also someone's daughter. Everyone has a mother. And so I thought, I always just think that's very interesting that there's that connection, even though it's her paintings, the subject matter is literally a mother and child, but that's not what they're all about. It's not just about motherhood. And I, I really don't think a lot of people realize that. And something else that really strikes me about Mary Cassatt's work is she, she, was really inspired by Japanese art. So, and I, when I when I noticed that, and I first started thinking about how she was inspired by Japanese art, I was like, um, "Is this cultural appropriation or not?" I don't, and I don't have the answer. I still don't know <clears throat> because I'm not an expert there. But what I did learn was that this concept of Japanism or Japanisme, and I know I'm butchering the pronunciation of that. Please forgive me. Um, it's a French term from the late 19th century. It described the craze for Japanese art in Western art. So, and I was like, okay, so they were just, everybody was just like really into Japanese culture back then. And then I learned that it swept France and other Western art, like Western countries where art was prominent, America, because trade with Japan had been banned or closed to the West since 1600. So then in the 1850s, when they opened trade back up, yeah, everybody's like, wow, you know, ooh, I remember these Japanese artists or, you know, it's like, it was like a, a new and everybody got reintroduced to it. So it was really exciting. I, boy, I love warm colored eyeshadow. The reason I put this under my eyes, like some people say baking, but the reason I do it is because I can brush it off and any eyeshadow that has like fallen down will come off with it. The more you know. So today, let's go ahead and talk about this work of art by Mary Cassatt. Now I'm gonna show you this and I'm gonna tell you the things that strike me. So if you're having like, this is just art history, it's art that makes you smarter, but if you're a teacher and you wanna talk about art with your kids, like. I love talking about art with kids. <clears throat> I would not have a problem showing this to students. They've all seen a naked baby's rear end. Um, I don't think that's vulgar. Um, if this kid were any older, it might get vulgar, but here we have a small child whose mother is bathing him. Honestly, I think children are much more receptive to this than adults are, because we're like, oh, it's a butt. But kids are like, oh yeah, I have a little brother. He gets baths. So this, I really, my favorite thing about this is the, their backs, like the, the slant of their backs are almost, almost 
Like if the line kept going of that baby's back, it would almost be perpendicular. For all practical purposes, it does make a cross of perpendicular lines. And it's there's just something about that that like draws your eyes straight to that baby. There's all that other stuff going on, like the color is in her dress and the color is in the pot she's using with for the water um, and her dark hair and that pale skin of that baby and the way those lines are, are drawn really make you focus on that child. So you could say maybe the child is the focus of this picture, but then when you, when you let your eye wander and you explore a little further, you notice the look on the mother's face. And that is something that would be, I would, it would be so amazing to like, just talk to kids about what is, what is she thinking? What is she feeling? Like, um, she looks a little weary to me. Um, I don't, she doesn't look angry, but she doesn't look like real excited to be there either. She doesn't look like she's mad and wants to walk away, but she's like, it's almost like, okay, here we go. I got to clean this baby again. He's then wiped his breakfast pancake syrup all over his body again when he just had a bath an hour ago and here we go again so she's just like I have to do this I'm tired but I'm going to do it anyway because it's the right thing to do for my child and the way that she is looking down her line of sight I don't think her eyes are closed I think her eyes are she's looking down but her her line of sight is almost straight at her arm so you might have that discussion with your students is she looking down at that child at her child or is she looking at the water i think she's looking at the water she's not gazing lovingly on that little boy or or that child i don't know if it's i don't know that child's gender um now you could talk about feelings and what they're thinking um what the child is doing why is the child you know why is she holding the child that way why is the child just standing there. The child doesn't look like he's fighting her or trying to get away or whatever. You can talk about all that kind of stuff and talk about the subject matter in this one. Or you could also show this Japanese work and talk about similarities and differences. Probably the first thing you're going to have to talk about is you might as well go ahead and let those kids get it out of their system about the baby having sideburns. And you you just can say, okay, get it out of your system. This is this was something you would see in this style of artwork during this time period. Um, from Japan. And since we know Mary was inspired by this Japanese art because trade had been reopened to the West, how is this similar and how is it different? Well, the first thing I notice is she, this mother looks a whole, whole lot more involved than the other mother. She's like, well, she's got a comb in her hair and she is getting in there with that rag and she's not playing with this baby. He, I mean, she's like, she's got a job to do and she is going to get it done. In some ways, this, okay, so this mother does not look, she does not look poor or anything, but she just looks like she's working hard and like she's got a lot to do. And I say that because there's a lot of more detail here. Like I said, the comb and she is really leaning in and she is, Almost, you can almost see her wiping that baby's face with that rag. In Mary's image, there's like no movement happening. When you look at that, you're like, well, are they stuck? Are they stuck there? Are they frozen? Because th there's nothing, it does not look like she's about to move. She's about like, they're just stuck there. So what's, to my mind, I'm trying to think, okay, well, what does that mean? Could it mean something? And I asked myself, well, why would one of these mothers be so much more involved in the other one than the other one? Why is the one being so much more hands-on and she's really getting in there and there's lots of, feels like hustle and bustle happening in one image and the other image is very calm and almost, it's just still. And I thought about Mary Cassatt's upbringing. She probably was raised in a home where they had lots of help. Um, the mother probably, I mean, the mother probably had a lot of help giving the kids baths, preparing their food. And that was probably the lifestyle Mary was used to. So if this mother is used to having a lot of help, maybe, maybe she's taking her sweet time because she literally doesn't have anything else to do that day. She's giving her baby a bath. She's not worried about anything else. And she's just taking her sweet time. Maybe she's not happy. Maybe she's 
maybe she's um, bored because maybe she has too much help. I don't know. I don't know. This is speculating, and this is I just I want to I want to talk about the art, but I want to really really want to model for you how you think about art. So in the other, in the Japanese print, the mother is moving fast. Like she looks to me like she's got to go do fifteen other things. She's probably running through her list in her head. What I got to do next? What I got to do next? I got to hurry up and get this baby cleaned up because I got to go do something else. And so there's just a huge. She was so inspired by this style of work, but you can see the differences. And I think it's really interesting to look at the two side by side. Um, now, I'm not saying that this is the specific work that she was inspired by. I'm saying this is one that could have inspired her. It's the similar subject matter that makes this a relevant conversation. I forgot to mention too, the colors um, of both of these have just almost a similar color palette. It's just that muted gold, browns, khaki, off-white kind of color palette. And I don't know that that, well, even though the color palettes are, the, are similar, Mary's, are, Mary's colors are brighter. Um, as we see them um, over time, thing, the colors of things change, but I feel like her, uh, even though those colors are bolder than the other one, you still get a hustle and bustle feel from the one that doesn't have as much color. So you could you could talk about that with students. You could say, hey, look at the lines of this uh, rope that's hanging down. It looks like the wind could be blowing. Lots of things to talk about here. And I don't wanna take up too much of your time. I'm almost ready. I'm gonna finish up, um, put on some lips and maybe some mascara and I'll be ready. But here's what I really hope for you to get out of this art that makes you smarter. Um, in my work as a teaching artist, so hard, I don't know if I can talk and do this at the same time. Uh, who cares if it's straight? In my work as a teaching artist, I've found that sometimes teachers don't talk talk about art with students because they don't know what to they don't know what they're supposed to say. So, art that makes you smarter is to help you start seeing ways that you can make art fit into your curriculum. It's, I mean, it's for us that just love art anyway, but, and want to talk about art, but it's also like, how, how can this, how can I talk about this with my students? Maybe it's Mother's Day and you want to do something for Mother's Day with your class, but you need to make it rigorous so that you can actually do it. And it's not just a piece of fluff that you're going to get in trouble for. Do this like critical thinking activity with the students, have these two work side by side and look for similarities and differences. It's not hard, we can all do it. And it really does just make kids, it just makes them get so much more engaged in what you're teaching and what they're learning and they're gonna remember it. They will remember it. So um, anyways, I would love to know your thoughts down below in the comments. I read all the comments and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Try to hang in there. I know it's hard right now. But let me know if you need anything. I'm here for you and I'm sending you so much positive energy. See you next time. Bye.